<laughs> but how many know that when when uh, when God told the devil that his seed would be against the seed of the woman and bruise his heel? How many know we talked about this morning what the seed of the serpent really is? Remember what the seed of y'all told me what the seed of the serpent is. The Bible plain that God said. Now we're, let's forget about what somebody else preached. Let's forget about who's against it. Let's don't think about some other preacher that preached it that nobody agreed with. Let's get back to the Bible. I am a stickler for what the Bible said. Now God said that the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Now we all know who the seed of the woman is, don't we? Jesus Christ, isn't that right? Well, who's the seed of the serpent? It's the Adam nature. Faith and Hemino came into Adam and Eve's nature, and Hemino they reproduced after the nature of Satan, so they became the fallen Adam race, became the descendants of the spirit of Satan. Isn't that right? All under the curse. Isn't that right? But Hemino that God promised right there that He would send forth the seed of the woman that would redeem man and purchase us back and get the and defeat the devil and bring us back into and restore all things back that we had fallen from. And we know the whole Old Testament, we talked about this morning, the whole Old Testament, and all the prophets talked about a Messiah that was coming, a Redeemer that was coming, a Savior that was coming, that was going to redeem us back. And we know when, uh, when that was prophesied, they waited and waited and waited for 4,000 years. But how many know the Redeemer finally got here? Four Gospels tells us the Redeemer has come. The Savior has come. But then how many know that when Jesus came, he came to redeem us back and to also show us what we're all created to be to start with, which was having dominion over the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the winds and the waves. And we know everything that was created, Jesus showed us what God created us to be to start with, and that's have dominion. We're going somewhere. Hold on a minute. So therefore... When Jesus came, he showed us what dominion was all about. He had dominion over the devil. Amen. He had dominion over demons and devils and sickness and disease. He had dominion over the creation of God. And then he turned around and he gave himself a sacrifice so that we could die to the Adam race, to the devil's race, and be born into the God race. And him and know the Bible says he came to his own, his own received him up, not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. The Bible says that he was the firstborn among what? Many brethren. He was the first begotten son. But him and know if he was the first begotten, then that means there's going to be some more begotten. Him and know the Bible plainly tells us we're begotten of God, not of the will of man, not of the will of the flesh, but we also are begotten of God. So therefore now we are born of God. And now we're in the family of God. And have me know that when Paul came along, now the book of Acts, you know, they healed, uh, healed some sick and, you know, and, the, and they preached the baptism of, I mean, they preached salvation, they preached the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they preached healing the sick in the book of Acts. But have me know Jesus didn't come just to give ministers in the body of Christ authority to heal the sick, cast out devils, and to get people saved. Have me know there's got to be more to the gospel than that. And there is. We didn't know what the furtherance of the gospel was until Paul came along and the Lord visited Paul and gave him a revelation of what Jesus actually came and did. And that was to come to redeem us and restore us back. And he, how many know, he took care of the curse that was brought on mankind because of sin. And how many know, he has redeemed us from that. Isn't that right? So what we're talking about, now we're up to where we were what the Lord's laid on my heart tonight, and that is the fact that now if Jesus has redeemed us and he already completed the redemptive work and he plainly says that he did while he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, he said, it's finished. Isn't that right? Then he turned around and he said in another place in John, he said, I have finished the work that you sent me to do. Well, Jesus didn't come to just save people, a few people, and cast out a few devils and heal a few sick folks. He came as our Redeemer. Well, did he do the job? Did he do it all the way? Did he just partly redeem us? And then he's going to finish the redemption when he comes back. 
Now, that is what the gospel is. It's being preached in a lot of religious circles. As Jesus came and he partly redeemed us, he saved us. But, you know, one of these days when he comes back, we're all going to be healed. We're all going to be sanctified. We're all going to be purified. And, boy, we're all going to be ready to go up. Amen? But how many know Jesus finished his work 2,000 years ago? The redemption is complete. Look up to your neighbor and say, redemption is complete. Now, the whole Old Testament and all of the world waited for the promised Messiah to come to bring redemption back to mankind. They waited on it. But how many know when Jesus came, he did what God had ordained him to do, which was be our Redeemer. But how many know the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that the whole creation groaneth until the manifestation of the sons of God, which are the rest of the sons of God. And though the first son of God had his job to do, but the other rest of the sons of God, the Bible plainly says that the whole creation groaneth in travail, waiting for God to bring forth the manifestation of these sons, because God's got to work for the latter sons just like he did the early sons. We talked about this before. How many of the Old Testament, how many know the Old Testament was a blueprint? And then we didn't understand what the blueprint read. So what God did, he sent us a scale model of what the blueprint was all about. Jesus is a scale model of what the Old Testament was all about. How many know he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament? But how many know the scale model is still not the finished product? How many know the Bible plainly says that Jesus is the head of the body? Have you ever seen a body running around that just was only a head? No, there's no such thing as a head. A, a body that is just a head. How many know a head's not a body? Isn't that right? But how many know a head needs a body? But how many know the body needs a head? So the Bible says that he's the head of the body. So what the whole creation is waiting on is for the body of Christ or the sons of God to come into submission to the head of the body and start yielding ourselves to him and let him start giving his signals to us what an impulse is what he wants us to do. Isn't that right? So therefore, the whole creation, Jesus is not the fullness. He is only, the, well, he's the scale model of that which is pointing forward to the fullness, which is the many-membered body of Christ. It's going to be in the end time, it's going to be Christ the head over all of the body, and we're the many-membered body through which God in Christ is going to manifest himself through us, and he's going to turn the world upside down and bring redemption to the whole thing. I'm sorry, but I'm just about to have a fit up here. I said what he's going to do is God is in Christ, and what he did through the head... Jesus said the same thing the Father did through the head. He's going to do it through the body. The same works that I do shall you do, and greater works than these shall you do. Why? Because there are going to be more of us for one reason. So what the whole creation is waiting on is for the body to come into the full statue of Christ. But how many know we're waiting on God to do something? And what we need to realize, it is already done. Now, I know that so many Christians have a problem with that. But the Bible plainly says that Jesus finished the work and he is exalted and ascended up to heaven or ascended into where the Father was in the spiritual realm. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, which is a place of authority. And you know, that don't mean he's sitting in a, God's sitting in a big old chair and Jesus sitting in a little chair side of him. Seated at the right hand means the place of authority. So Jesus is what? Seated in the place of authority. The Bible says through, I mean, God spoke through David and said until all of his enemies has made his foot to. He's not going to come back and do that later. I mean, no, he's seated in rest. I mean, no, if you're seated, you're resting. You cease from your labor. Well, not nowadays, but you should be resting while you're seating, seated. Isn't that right? So he has ceased from his labors what is he waiting on? He's waiting for us to come into the knowledge of the fullness of the statue of Christ. That's what Ephesians tells us. Ephesians chapter 4 says that he has placed in the body apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the maturing of the saints until we all come into the unity of the faith and all come into the knowledge of the fullness of the statue of Christ. So what Christ is waiting on 
We're waiting on him, and he's waiting on us. What is he waiting on? He's waiting on us to come into the full knowledge of what we are already and start living like that and let him manifest that through us. He hath redeemed us. So the first thing that I, the Lord laid on my heart to do, and I'll tell you what, I hope, I, I told Sister Barbara before I came, I said, you pray for me that the Lord would give me the utterance to get out what all this is on the inside. You can probably tell I'm trying to do like this. Because there's so much in there tonight that I'm going to have to pray. Y'all going to have to help me pray for God to give me the words to get it all out. I got in the bed at 15 to 5 this morning. He kept me up all night. Now, I'll try to cut it down for y'all and give you a condensed version. Aren't you glad of that? <laughs> but what we, what the Lord is, uh, uh, was talking to my heart about last night is all the things that Jesus came and did that is a finished thing. The Bible tells us, have you found 3 John yet? Verse 2, 3 John and verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. Now that verse has been totally taken out of context by the prosperity message. He is not talking about that I want you to be wealthy and drive Lexus and Cadillacs and all this. If he did, then Paul missed it, and John missed it, and they all missed it. What he's saying right here is he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper. That means progress, make progress. It means to, to, to make progression in your Christian walk. It means to succeed. It means to reach your goal. And how many of our goals is not supposed to be the wealth of the world? I mean, oh, God says that we'll seek first the kingdom. He'll add this stuff to us, but I mean, we're not supposed to seek it. Amen. He said he wished above all things that we would progress and be in health even as our soul progresses. I mean, oh, we talked about this morning how the spirit is saved instantly. It's changed and born again like that. But the soul is being restored. It's being redeemed. Amen. So he's saying right here, as the soul prospers or as the soul progresses, he wants us to, our spiritual life to progress. He wants us to be in health, walk in health. Notice he didn't say healed. He said in health. Then for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou what? Walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, what? Walk in the truth. And know the Lord, what he's saying is, I don't want us to, he said, I'm, I'm not looking for y'all to just know the truth. And know John wasn't wanting all the, the church, all of us to the church, just to know the truth. He wanted to see us walking in. I believe with all my heart, saints of God, that that's what the Lord is wanting, to see his children walking in the truth. Well, I'm walking in the truth. I am too, as much as I know. But how many know that there's a whole lot more truth that I want to walk in? How many know the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word? Isn't that right? All right, let's go down to Psalms 103. Got a lot of scriptures here tonight. I pray you brought your Bible. Because we, we don't preach out of the Bible. We preach from the Bible. You know what I mean by that? Some, that's what's wrong with a lot of people that preach out of the Bible. <laughs> Slam out of it. Psalms 103. And verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his what? Benefits. Those benefits were brought to us through the redemptive work of Christ. Amen? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth what? All thy diseases, who what? Redeemeth thy life from what? Destruction. Who crowneth thee with what? Loving kindness and tender mercies. And who satisfieth thy what? Mouth with good things. Why? So that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. Now these are benefits that Jesus that, that David, God spoke through David and said for us to remember the benefits. 
But the Bible tells us in Ephesians that we were Gentiles without any benefits. We were in the world without hope, without a covenant. But hey, you know, when we are born of Jesus Christ and now we're born into the family of God, now we have benefits because we're born into a family that has an inheritance. Is that right? What are the benefits? Every one of those that was promised to us when we came into covenant with Jesus Christ or the new covenant. Isn't that right? Mm-mm-mm. Look at your neighbor and say, don't forget the benefits. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, verse 4, Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs, which is sickness, weaknesses, and distresses, is what that grief, that word grief means and carried our sorrows, which is our pain in the original. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for what? Our transgression. He was what? Bruised for whose iniquity? Ours. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, who is we? That's us. Are healed. We, I mean, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. Help me. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of who? Us all. So what he was saying right here, Isaiah was prophesying when Jesus came that he would bear our sins, he would bear our iniquities, all of us were like sheep that gone astray, but having know that he bore the penalty of that in his own body, and he also bore in his own body the curse that came on us because of sin. I mean, the curse that came on us because of sin is spiritual death or separation from God. I mean, when sin comes, it separates us from God. Isn't that right? And it also, sin brought on the curse of sicknesses and diseases. I mean, it opened our body up to death. Well, sickness and disease is premature death. I mean, sickness can lead to death. Isn't that right? So he bore even the penalty of sin in his own body. And also he, he uh, bore the chastisement of our peace was upon him. I mean, he bore all of that. And who did he bear it for? Us. Now, we know that this was prophesying of the Redeemer who was to come. And how many know we already established that Redeemer has already come. Now, every one of these benefits are ours right now. But do you know that they really don't benefit us that much as a whole as God's people? I mean, we benefit from forgiveness of sins. Boy, we like that part, don't we? And we like the other, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. But the Bible don't stop right there. He says that he bore all of my sicknesses and cured all of my diseases. Every one of them. And he said, by his stripes, who's healed? We are. So what the Lord has laid on my heart, if these things are so, why aren't we benefiting from them more than what we are? Now, I thank God for the benefits that we receive. I thank God for what we're already experiencing. But how many know there's 10 times more about the redemption that we're not experiencing than they are that we are experiencing? And I say it's been 2,000 years. We've only experienced a very little part of the redemptive work of Christ. So let me know that I want to know all of the benefits. Let me want to know all the benefits. I want to know everything Jesus bought and paid for that he has put into my account. And I want to, I want to benefit from those. I want to, to experience those. I, it's not good enough for me. And it's not good enough for you for us to just know all of this and believe all of that. But it has no effect on our life. He says, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in what? It's God's will for us to walk in total perfect health and not get sick and have to get healed all the time. Redemption is not getting healed. Redemption is redeemed from sickness, period. And what God is doing, saints of God, in the end time, there is going to be a group of people 
that is absolutely going to know what we have in Christ, what we were redeemed from and into, and we're going to walk and live in this, and that's not some fantasy, that's not some dreamland, that is the truth, it's already there, it's paid for, it's in our account right now, I want to experience and learn to walk in it. Because the neighbor said, I want to walk in this. Mm, 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 mm. So good. All right, the Bible, let's turn to 1 John. Let's go all the way back over to the latter part of the New Testament. Now, I could just preach this tonight and run through this, but I felt by the Spirit for us to look these scriptures up. And let the word, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word. How can I believe in what I've not heard? Amen. How can we receive something that we have never heard about? Or if we have heard about, it has not produced faith. And you know, we've heard a lot of this, but sometimes in time past, it has not produced faith in us. And you know, it's time we hear it, but let it produce faith in us. Amen. You found First John 2 and 2. 1 John 2 and 2. And he, let's back up to 1. My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the perpetuation for our sins. That word perpetuation is a mercy seat. He is the mercy seat for our sins. And not only for our not and not for ours only, but also for the sins of who? When Jesus came and died on the cross, did he just die for our sins? He died and became the redeemer of the whole wide world. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of every human being on the face of the earth. It's already done. He's not going to do it again. He's already shed his blood for every creature, I mean, every person on the face of the earth. But why is it that they're not benefiting from it? I mean, just because Jesus did that, and it's true that he did that, and he is the mercy seat for the sins of the whole world, then why, why, is it, uh, why isn't everybody saved? Why aren't they benefiting from that? Number one, they don't know, and some of them do know, but they do not receive it, they do not exercise on it, they do not apply it, they do not uh, accept it by faith, and they do not uh, uh, experience what Jesus bought and paid for. I mean, the Lord wants them to experience it. Is everybody going to do it? I doubt it. I mean, are they still saved? I mean, Jesus has saved them. They might not accept it. They may go to hell without it, but I mean, Jesus already paid the price for them. Isn't that right? So he's telling us right here that he has absolutely shed his blood and become the mercy seat for not just us, but for the sins of the whole world. Uh, uh, uh. All right, Psalms, let's go all the way back to Psalms 107. Psalms 107. Why well, I love the Bible, don't you? Uh, uh, uh. Let me say this while you're turning to Psalms 107. I want to get, get this on the tape because the Lord was speaking to my heart about this. And that is in Psalms 119 and 160, verse 160, he says, the sum of thy word is truth. The sum, the total of God's word is truth. Now let me emphatically speak this. We get in trouble by picking and choosing scriptures. It's in the volume of the book the gospel must be preached. I mean, it must be received. It's in the totality of the Bible that we get the truth. It ain't pick and choose this truth and that truth. and the other. These are all truths within themselves, but it takes the sum of the total to make up the whole truth. And it's time, saints of God, that we quit picking the truth that we want to embrace and letting the rest of it go. It's time to have the totality or the sum of all of it so we'll know the truth. And when we know the truth, it'll make us free. Is that right? Ephesians 1 and 10 says, all truth is summed up in Jesus Christ. And no, Jesus Christ is the sum of all truth. When Pilate said, what is truth? 
How many know truth was standing right in front of him? Jesus said, I'm the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So the truth is in Jesus Christ. Isn't that the truth? And then the Bible says that Jesus is the sum of all truth. And so, therefore, we know that when Jesus is standing there, he is the very living example of the truth. I mean, oh, in the volume of the Old Testament, it was written of him. So, therefore, he was standing there as the living word made flesh. I don't want to get bogged down there. But have you found Psalms 107 yet? Because your neighbor says the sum of the whole Bible that gives us the truth. Verse 1, Psalms 107. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Who hath redeemed. How many know that was prophetic of when Jesus came. That he was coming to redeem us. Now we can literally know that this has already happened. He has already redeemed us. And who did he redeem us from? Out of the hand of our enemy. So we are not subject to the devil unless we allow him to come in and have his little say in our life. So let the redeemed of the Lord, what tense is that? Already done. All right, let's go all the way to Luke now, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, this is talking about, this is Zechariah, John the Baptist's daddy, who's prophesying here about the coming Messiah, that it's time for him to come. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Luke chapter 1, well, let's back up to 67. Luke 1 and 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and what? Redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who's he talking about here? Jesus Christ. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. We read in Acts chapter 3 this morning how that all the prophets prophesied of the restoration of all things, or the restoring back of everything that was lost in the fall. That's the purpose of the whole plan of God, is when man fell, the, the plan of God was to bring everything and restore it right back to what it was to begin with. We're going back to the Garden of Eden. We're going back to the place of authority. We're going back to redeem from the curse. We're going back to living in fellowship with God and having dominion over all things that God created. Can you say amen? So what it, and, and he says here in Verse 71, that we should be saved from what? Our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Mm -mm -mm. To perform the mercies promised our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. So what Zechariah is saying, all these, spirit, uh, all these prophecies, it's come to pass now. It's time. The Messiah's here. He's going to do everything he said he's going to do. So therefore, he's going to deliver us out of the hand of our enemies. When Jesus came, did he defeat the devil? Did he crush the devil's head? He's the seed of the woman who stomped the devil's head. Isn't that right? So he delivered us. Look over to the neighbor and say, I'm delivered out of the hand of my enemies. All right, let's go all the way now to 1 Peter. All the way back across the Bible, towards the latter part of the book, 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter, 20, uh, chapter 2 and verse 24. 1 Peter 2 and 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes, what? Ye were healed. Who's ye here? Us. 
though we were already healed. Now listen carefully. Because this is what the Lord began to talk to our hearts when we were in India. And that is the fact that Christians are trying to get the Lord to heal us. We are attacked by the enemy. He attacks our physical bodies. Or he attacks us and tries to attack us with sickness and disease. He tries to attack us uh, with sickness. And then what we do out of ignorance, we pray and pray and try to get the church to pray, try to get some special minister to pray for God to come, for the Lord to come and heal us. How can Jesus come and heal us when it's something that he's already done? Hold on. Is that not the truth? Uh oh. What does your Bible say? By whose stripes ye what tense is that? Well, when did he heal you? The same time he saved you. Well, when did he save me? When he shed his blood and died on the cross and rose from the dead, then him know all of us, when he was on the cross, we were on his mind. He saved the whole world while he died on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of all sins. He bore the stripes on his back that by his stripes we would be healed. But Hamino, he's already done that. So when he did that back then, then Hamino, we are healed. I know. I can, tilt, I, can, I can see your mind go tilt. Well, if I am healed, why aren't I benefit? Why am I not benefiting from that? That's what we're ministering about tonight. See, there's things in our account. Healing is already there. We have been delivered out of the hand of our enemy. Minister of the other day. Uh, you know, uh, I guess they got one of my tapes and they was preaching and they said, you know what? I don't understand certain preacher preaching that the devil's already been defeated. And if he's already been defeated, then why in the world is he fighting me so hard? Well, that's a fair question, isn't it? I mean, if the devil's defeated and the Lord's delivered me out of the hand of my enemy, then wh- who is this fighting me? We're getting there. Hold on just a little bit. Well, if he bore my sicknesses in his own body and he bore my sins in his own body and by his stripes I was already healed, then why in the world am I attacked with sicknesses? Good question, isn't it? That's a good question. Look over the neighbors. That's a good question. We're going to get there. Hold on. (laughs) By whose stripes you what? Is that present tense, future tense? See, when we're praying for the Lord to heal us and I'm going to get healed, then let me know what we're doing. We're actually waiting for something to take place that's already done. Let me ask you something. Did Jesus save you the night that you accepted him or did he already save you and you just came to the knowledge that he'd already shed his blood, he'd already died for you, and then when you came to the knowledge that Jesus was your substitute, you received Jesus Christ, and that was when you accepted your salvation, but he already paid for that 2,000 years ago. But even though you was already... uh, Jesus had already paid for your salvation. You was already paid, that salvation was paid for before you ever received it. Come on. We were saved by the works of Jesus, but we didn't know it. Jesus had already died. He'd already shed his blood. But then we came to the knowledge of it. When we came to the knowledge, when we heard the message, heard the gospel, we believed the gospel. And when we believed the gospel, we accepted that. And when we believed it in our heart and confessed it with our mouth, then him and we received our salvation. And know, there's a difference in you getting saved and Jesus saving you and you receiving your salvation. You say, boy, you are nitpicky. I wish it was that simple because this is what's going on with us. We are either redeemed past tense or we're going to be redeemed. Has Jesus the Redeemer come? Did he redeem us? Then why do we have a problem thinking that, well, if I am, then why ain't I? It's because, saints of God, that we have not yet learned, just like we finally learned or came into the knowledge to receive our salvation, we haven't really, as the church, come into the knowledge of how to receive all of our benefits yet. They're already there. It's it's like prego. It's in there. (laughs) I mean, redemption is already in Christ. 
It's already bought. It's paid for. It's there. My healing is already bought and paid for. My salvation is bought and paid for. My sins have already been forgiven by the blood of Jesus, but how do I have to receive it and accept that? Because the neighbor said, we got a lot of benefits in the bank. All right, look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, back up. 2 Corinthians. We're going somewhere. Hold on a little bit. Y'all still in here with me? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. He was made to be sin for who? Us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How many know Jesus has already done that? Did he become sin for me? Well, because he became sin for me, he did that so I could become righteous. Amen? Mm-mm-mm-mm. All right, let's go to Colossians. Colossians. Let's let the Word speak tonight. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 12. Colossians 1, verse 12 and 13, 14. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. Giving thanks unto the Father, which, what? Come on, help me now. Which, what? Hath made us eligible or meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath, past tense, delivered us from the, what? Power or authority of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his Son. I mean, when we accept Jesus Christ, that is experienced in our life. But Jesus did and paid for that 2,000 years ago. Did he not? Did he not defeat the devil 2,000 years ago? Did he not deliver mankind out from under the, 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 uh, our enemies 2,000 years ago? Did he not crush the devil's head 2,000 years ago? Did he not make it available to us and give us eligibility for us to receive that deliverance out of the kingdom of God, uh, out of the kingdom of darkness, and be translated into the kingdom of his dear son? Well, when we accepted Jesus, that happened. Amen? So you know what we are? We're in the kingdom of God now. We're in the family of God now. Now the curse and sin and sickness and disease is in the other family. It runs in the family. It is in the DNA of the fallen Adam race. The genes of sickness and disease is in the fallen Adam race. We have been born again, born to the nature of God, born from above, and now we're in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, there is no darkness in that at all. God's family doesn't have any genes that produces cancer. Hold on, please don't turn your plate over yet and, and just, well, boy, I don't get that. Hold on just a little bit. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by what? The Word. Well, I can't believe that, Brother Ron, because you know cancer attacks Christians, and they sure does, don't it? You know why the Christians get attacked with cancer? It's because we don't really know and understand that we're redeemed from that. So therefore, when Satan comes, we believe God, and God brings the healing. So it's the killing back here. God delivers her and gives her a miracle when she was attacked with cancer. Amen? But how many know the greater revelation would be for us to realize as the saints of God that we're in a family and when cancer comes and attacks us, we can stand up and say, oh, that don't belong in my family. I'm part of the family of God. You know what? That can't operate here. I'm delivered out of that kingdom. I'm translated over here in the kingdom of Jesus Christ and that don't work here, devil. Now, let me say this. Is any of us walking in the fullness of this yet? No. We've got to learn it first. We've got to be enlightened to the truth first. We can't walk in something that we're not spiritually enlightened to. But how many know the spiritual enlightenment comes? But how many know the Bible tells us we can walk in the light as he's in the light? If we're in the light, we can walk in it. And what is light? It's the word. The entrance of his word gives Light or understanding. So how, how can we walk in the light? Is walking in the Word. Ain't that what 3 John said? 
I mean, oh, by being enlightened, we can walk in it. And you know what? God's got a people that we're going to walk in total, complete redemption of everything that Jesus bought and paid for. And that's when the world is going to stand up and take a notice that you must be something different than what we are. Because you know what? That stuff don't bother you like it does the rest of us. What have you got? John G. Lake. He was working where they had to... Uh, Blue bonnet plague, plague. I think I got that right. Boo, boo, yeah, one of them plagues. And y'all know the story. People were dying everywhere to handle the people that had that plague. John G. Lake was handling it, working there, and he never got sick a day. They said, well, why don't you get sick? The rest of them dying, doctors dying and everything. He said, well, there's something in my body that keeps that from happening to me. What is it? He said, I'll tell you what, and he got some of the foam out, the, out of the mouth of one of those uh, sick people, and he went and stuck it up on the microscope, and when he put it on the microscope, that stuff, that germs, just died on his hand. What in the world have you got? What have you got? He said, it's the life of God in Christ Jesus that makes me free from the law of sin and death. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that makes me free from that. It can't live on me. Why? Because he, did he have something different than what we got? No. He just had more knowledge of it and believed it and walked in it and lived by it and it works. Let's back up now to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. When are we going? Who hath blessed us. What tense is that? With some of these spiritual blessings. You get the rest later. He has already blessed us with all the spiritual blessings that were brought to us by the redemptive work of Christ. We already have it. When? Now. <laughs> Do anything for y'all. I'm telling you, I just feel, I feel the word. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me while I just, I kind of have a fit. Mm. Second Peter 1. Three and four, Second Peter one, three and four. A lot of these we could just quote, but let's look them up. Second Peter one, three and four. Mm. Second Peter one, three and four. According as His divine power, what hath given unto us? How much? All things that pertain unto life and godliness through the, what? That's it. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. What? Having what? Escaped past tense the corruption that is in the world through lust. The Bible says that we have been saved from destruction. The Bible says that we are saved from the corruption that's in the world. The Bible says that we are saved from sickness and disease. The Bible says that we're saved from our sins. The Bible says that we have been redeemed from our enemies. The Bible says that we have authority and dominion through the name of Jesus. The Bible says... That he has paid all the penalty that came on us through, through Adam and Eve's sin. Jesus paid for all of that so that we can walk in newness of life. So we can live in newness of life. So we can live by the life of the resurrected Christ on the inside of us. So we can reap the benefits of what Jesus actually bought and paid for. He has. What tense is that? How much stuff is it given us? When are we going to get it? See, the church has been waiting on it. Brother Ron, I believe one of these days. I believe one of these days that Jesus is going to come and boy, we're going to get all of this stuff that he, he's already done it. Mm. When Jesus said it is finished, what did he mean? 
when he said in John 17 and 4, I have finished the work that you have sent me to do. What did he mean? He completed the redemption. Isn't that right? But see what we're talking about here. Now this is, this, this is going to be the switch side now. All of these are benefits that Jesus took and he paid for every one of us and he actually put it to our account. He placed redemption in our account, spiritual account. He placed salvation in my account before I ever knew that he had given me salvation. He placed healing in my account. It's already bought and paid for. It's there, pay me no, before we really know that by his stripes we were healed. It's already in there. He has already redeemed me out of the hand of my enemies, even though the devil has really worked on me for several years until about three years ago. I mean, I, you're talking about a devil fighter. Now, I was a devil fighter. I'm telling you, I have been fighting the devil all the way back. My daddy fought the devil. My grandpa was a preacher, Methodist circuit rider preacher. He fought the devil. As far back as you can remember, we were devil fighters. Then three years ago, I found out that Jesus whipped him. And he delivered me out from under his authority and dominion. And now I'm not in his kingdom anymore. Now I'm over here in Jesus' kingdom and Satan has no authority, no dominion over here. He's trespassing when he comes over here. Now I don't fight him anymore. Well, why don't you fight him anymore? Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Can I have a few more minutes? Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, it says in chapter 1 that God had raised Christ from the dead and, and, and verse 21, and set him far above all principalities and powers, mights and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his what? Now, he's a head. He's the head. Who's the feet? We are. So he put all things under, when is he going to do this? hath put all things, where? Under his feet, which we are, and gave to him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And ye hath he, hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Then it talks about we walked in as Gentiles after the lust of the flesh. But listen to what it says in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love for in for with he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. Now, when did he quicken us? When we got saved? What does your Bible say? When we were dead, still dead in trespasses and sin, Jesus made it legally, quickened us, and made us alive in him. We didn't know it. I mean, if you don't know something, you can't experience it. Did he, did he bear our sins? Amen. Did he quicken us while we were yet sinners? We have a hard time with that. Ain't that what your Bible says? Even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. Why? By grace are you saved. How did he quicken us with Christ? Because we were in Christ. Remember all of the whole fallen Adam race was put inside of Jesus? And when Jesus died, we all died? Are y'all with me? Didn't God the Father put all of us in Christ? And we you know Adam was the first Adam that sinned. Jesus was the last Adam. And he took the whole Adam race and put it on the inside of Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, every human being was crucified in Christ. And then, while we were in Christ, then he was died on the cross, he was buried, but then God, what? Raised him from the dead, and guess where we were when he was being raised from the dead? Are y'all bored? I'm about to blow up. 
Where were you when Jesus was raised from the dead? Huh? Let me ask you something. How'd you get to the United States? You come by boat, plane, or what? How did you get here? You was in your ancestors. <laughs> Excuse me while I have a little fit. I don't know when my ancestors came over, but I was in them. That's how I was born here rather than there. Oh, my God. So I'm born in America because I was in my ancestors when they came over. I was in the seed form, but I was still in them. My ancestor, my mother is full blood Dutch. I've never lived in Holland, but her ancestors was from Holland. Ain't it in Dutch from Holland? Holland Dutch. Okay. My my dad was uh, you know, he was Irish and whatever else he was, Welch. And here I am. I'm, you know, I'm Welch, Irish, and Dutch, and I'm in America. How did I get here? By boat, plane, swam. I didn't do none of it. How did I get here? I was in them. This is going to hit us one of these days and we're going to jump up and, yeah! <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> when did he quicken me? When I was in Christ. Did I know it back then? No. But he knew that I was going to be of his ancestors, of his seed, and that seed was going to be born back in 1900. Yeah. When he was on the cross, you was on his mind. Why did he go to the, as a lamb to the slaughter without opening his mouth? He was guiltless, but you was guilty, so therefore he kept his mouth shut when he was accused because he was taking my guilt and my accusation. He was taking it on himself. He suffered every bit of that, keeping his mouth shut because I was guilty, but he wasn't. Why did he bear stripes on his back? He wasn't under the curse. He didn't have sickness and disease. Why did he become sin? Why did he allow them to beat him on his back? Why? Because I was inside of him. And he said, I'm going to redeem Ron Thomas. I'm going to redeem Brother Wilson. I'm going to redeem them people over there in Harris, Arkansas. They're not here yet, but they will be here. Guess what I am now? I was born to Thomas. Born in Florida, just north of Pensacola. When I was born, God saw me. My name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. Jesus was slain before the world was ever formed. Our little old mind can't comprehend that. It's hard for me to comprehend that. But the Word says so. I believe it. You know what that means? That means I'm in the family of God. How did I get here? By work? No, by birth. How did I inherit all of these redemptive things? It wasn't my goodness. It wasn't anything I did. I'm born of him that was an heir of all things, which is Jesus Christ. I am a seed of Abraham born to the seed of Jesus Christ. So that makes me a joint heir with Jesus Christ and an heir of God to join an heir with Jesus Christ. Well, that sure would be wonderful if it was true. It is. But sure would be wonderful if I knew how to live by that. We are. Philippians tells us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I knew there's a hitch to it somewhere. Let's go there. Philippians 2. Turn right from Ephesians. Philippians 2. Hmm. They may have to be a part 3 to this. I don't know. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Whew. 
Why do we quote the first verse, the 12, and never, very seldom, ever quote the 13th verse? Work out. Now, let, 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 let me try to get this in, in a conclusion here somewhere, where we can get it all together here and at the end here. <laughs> Everything, listen carefully, because we, we're wrapping it up. Everything that we needed as the fallen Adam race and the curse that was on the world, God provided it through Jesus Christ. None of us could save ourselves. None of us could do anything to help ourselves. So everything, what Jesus did, I mean, what God did through Jesus Christ, he paid all of it and put it in our account. Isn't that right? But now what the Lord is saying, even though it's in your account, it's not you that's got to try to get it and obtain it and try to have faith to try to get it to work in us. Listen carefully. Boy, this is the, this is the golden nugget right here. It's not me taking it and trying to work out my salvation. Not only did God put all of the redemption in my account through Jesus Christ, and now I'm born into the family, and I'm heirs of all of that. I mean, just because you're an heir of something don't mean you got it. I mean, you can be an heir of something and not get to enjoy your inheritance. But you know what God did? You know what Jesus Christ did? Him and the Father worked this plan out. No, I'm not Trinity. I'm talking about God who is spirit already planned it through his son Jesus Christ that what he was going to do was when Jesus died and bought all of this and put it in our account and now we're in the family of God. Then God did something that was very unusual. He was in Christ and him and Christ didn't go off on a planet somewhere. He turned around and said, no. He said, I'll tell you what. Jesus said, tells us this in John 14. He said, you know what we're going to do? Me and the Father, we're going to come and we're going to take up our boat and live on the inside of you. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. When I come and live on the inside of you, then what I'm going to do is take all of those redemptions and it's going to be me that's working this out on the inside of you. It's not going to be you, but it's going to be I that's on the inside. I'm going to do it. I'm going to produce it. I'm going to make it alive in you. Where's works at, Brother Ron? There ain't none. Well, how are we going to get it? By faith. How are we going to obtain it? By faith. No, you don't obtain it by faith. You receive it by faith. Saints of God, we've got to change our mentality. We're not having faith to obtain. We're having faith to receive. Did y'all get that? Woo! Let me ask you one question. Second close and none skip first. When God called Abraham out and he told Abraham, said, Abraham, I want you to leave your family there are the Chaldees. I'm going to carry you and show you a country that I'm going to give you. But then he turned around and he said, you know what? I'm going to give you a son. Notice what God did. God came to Abraham and told Abraham what he was going to do for him. Abraham believed what God said he was going to do. Now we got the church has got this thing backwards. Well, what it was, Abraham believed God and got him a son. <laughs> Abraham's faith did not obtain him a son or, 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 or get him a son. I mean, oh, faith was believing that God going to give him one. <laughs> I want to ask you this. Did Abraham ever ask God for a son? Not in the beginning. He asked him later on, where's he at? But God's the one that come and told Abraham what he was going to do for him. Abraham, just believe what God said I'm going to do for you. That's faith. Not faith to obtain it, but faith to what? Oh, I hope we get this. If we don't get nothing else tonight, let's get this down pat. Faith is not to obtain. Faith is to what? Receive. Receive what? What God has promised. Receive an inheritance. We are more than conquerors. Third closing. We're more than conquerors. Oh my God. Boy, there's conqueror, but I'm greater than a conqueror. That ain't what that means. We're more than a conqueror. A conqueror is someone who has to go out and war and fight to get it or work to obtain it. They conquer it. We're more than a conqueror. What does that mean? 
I'm an heir of everything Jesus went out and fought for. An heir is someone who received an inheritor that somebody else bought and paid for. You didn't work for it. You didn't obtain it. You didn't earn it. You didn't get it. Only thing you got to do is receive it. Receive it. We have a problem with receiving. You know, Goodwill, it's in our nature not to receive free gifts from anybody. Because when somebody gives you something, our little mind starts working. Now, what did I do that caused them to be so kind to me? I wonder what I did for them. It's so, so nice and so, so kind. It must have been something I did that caused them to like me. Uh -huh. And then, after they give it to us, then you know what we start doing? If it's a big gift, then we feel obligated to work and, and be kind to them and nurture them and bless them and, and pat them on the back and love on them to let them know, oh boy, we want them to make sure it's almost impossible for us as humans to receive a big gift and say, thank you. Oh, I don't deserve this. You shouldn't have done that. I don't know why you would ever do this. That's in all of us. What do you do when you receive a nice gift? Oh, you shouldn't have. What does Ron do when I receive a nice gift? Oh, you shouldn't have done that. I don't deserve this. Y'all look at me next time and say, no, you didn't. But we loved you anyway. <laughs> it's so hard for us to say, thank you, Father. Lord, I receive everything that's rightfully mine. I receive it. I believe it. Now, Christ on the inside of me, work this out in my life. Be it unto me according to thy word. Listen carefully. Be it unto me according to your word. I'm not going to get to the main point that I was headed for tonight. There's just no way I can get there. What is it? Romans 10, 8 and 9. Let this, we'll try to be the closing on it. Romans 10, Romans 10, 8, verse 8 and 9. Romans 10, 8 and 9. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He says, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that's how we receive our salvation. Is that what your word says? Ain't that what it says? So how do we receive the first part of our inheritance? Romans 8, I mean Romans 10, 8 through 9, it says how do we receive our salvation? I mean, we already shared how Jesus bought and paid for our salvation, did he not? How do we receive salvation? When we heard it preached, we believed it in our hearts. And when we believed it in our hearts, then we confessed that I believe that. I received that. And now how you did it? Isn't that how we did it? Is received the message of faith of our salvation. We received it. We believed it in our heart and we confessed it with our mouth and that brought us salvation. Did we work for it? What did you do to get it? Believed it. And what? Received it. Believed it. And then confessed. And when you confess it, when you say, I believe this, it's mine, I claim it, then it's yours. Oh, that's too simple. I don't believe in getting saved like that. I believe you've got to come down to these altars. And now I'm not against this. Please, please don't un misunderstand what I'm saying. But I've got to hit this as a point. If you feel like coming to the altars and you feel like weeping and pouring your heart out, that's great. That's a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's perfectly all right. But that's not what saves you. 
The only way to get saved is for you to believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood. You accept his substitute for your sin. That's the only way to get saved. And then when you get up and say, I receive my salvation. I believe. I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Why? Because he said, if you'll confess, believe on the Lord, and you shall be what? Saved. And he, he said, if you shall be, then that means I am saved. And you know what? I have actually prayed for people in the altars over and over and over and over who come down and cries and weeps and begs and pleads the Lord to save me. Please save me. And get up night after night. I've actually experienced this. Experienced this. Get up disappointed. And their countenance falling. I don't know when he's going to do it. But I want the Lord to save me so bad. Why was he not receiving his salvation? He was wanting some feeling to come so he could believe he was saved. That don't get you saved. I said, that don't save you. A feeling is not what saves you. What, what we had to minister to him, what we shared with him, is what the scripture says, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess that he's your substitute, he shed his blood, and ask him to forgive you your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you. And you know what? You shall be saved. He didn't say sometimes will, sometimes will. You shall be. So what you got to do is believe what God said. And if, he, if we don't believe the word pertaining to salvation and we keep on begging God for it, how long is it going to take us to get saved or to receive our salvation? Nobody knows. Well, when's the Lord going to come and save me? Is it the Lord's fault that the man wasn't, didn't receive his salvation? What was it? Ignorance. Ignorance of not knowing the truth. Ignorance of not hearing the truth. Ignorance of not believing the truth because he hadn't heard it. But you know what? I'm saying this before the Lord when we shared the scriptures with him. And you know what? Jesus said you shall be saved. If you receive the Son, you have life. If you have not the Son, you have not life. Receive Jesus in your heart. You've got eternal life. Believe that. Confess it with your mouth. And you know what? When he did, I'm telling you, the glory of the Lord hit the man's face. He stood up and started praising God. And know the feeling came after faith was there. I said, feelings come after faith. But feelings don't come before faith. Is it time to quit? I guess it is. One more closing. One more. Second Corinthians. Thank you, brother. I needed that one. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Chapter 4. Second Corinthians, chapter 4. This is my last closing. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 13. Second Corinthians 4 and 13. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. Now, who is that talking about? That is from Psalms 116 and 10, and it is prophesying of Jesus, and he said that Jesus, this is pro prophesying of Jesus, when he said, I believed what was written of me, and therefore I spoke. I mean, Jesus believed what God said in his word about him. We have this picture of Jesus that he was all-knowing and knew everything, and he was the son of God, so therefore, I mean, he didn't have no trouble, you know. But that wasn't the truth. I mean, that ain't the way it is. He said that it was the word of God that was written of him. He said, in the volume of the book is written of me. He believed what was written of him. How did he know that he wasn't going to be in the ground for three days? It was in the Word. Oh, God spoke to him and told him. Yeah, God did speak to him. You know where he spoke to him? In Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the bed of the well, so shall the Son of Man be. He believed that, so he spoke that. Then he also said what David said. He said that he will not leave my body in hell, and he will not allow me to see corruption. But I mean, oh, he knew that corruption was starting three days, so he knew that the Father was going to raise him. He believed, therefore he spoke it. Come on now. How did Jesus operate in what the word said? He believed it and spoke it. How are we going to receive what the word says? We're going to believe it and say it and believe it and speak it. Now, I'm not talking about speaking a bunch of stuff off your head. I'm talking about believing in your heart and saying it with your mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Revelation chapter 12 says, And they overcame him by the what? 
blood of the lamb and by what? The what? That's how we're going to overcome. If we don't start opening our mouth, no wonder the devil runs over us. We don't open our mouth. And you know how Jesus stopped the devil? Huh. Come on. By the word. How are you going to stop the devil? Well, he just beats up on me all the time. Why are you let him beat up on you all the time? Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Turn around and let the devil know the word of God says that I'm delivered out of your hand. You have no dominion over me. You can't rule over me. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. And have me know it has to work. Everybody stand to your feet.